what is the market telling you? It's all boils down to data, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, real estate, it's all data, you know? It's black and white. Is the goal here to flip this or are we looking for a hold to keep this for long-term cash flow? And then there's all the different ways that you can hold too. Guys, welcome back to video two in this special masterclass series that I'm doing with Tony Mont. Tony, this is really fun. Guys, if you missed video one, go back and watch that. We really broke down why we put this masterclass together, why we're doing it all about exit strategies. We have a whole lineup of like a dozen videos we're gonna do. We're gonna start to get into the weeds and really talk about specific exit strategies, how to look at them, how to break them down. But before we get there, Tony, we really wanna make sure that we lay the groundwork appropriately. And on this video, we're gonna be focusing on the difference between holding strategies and flipping strategies. Right. And I think this is really key because in later videos, when we get into the different exits, some of those exits are flipping and some of those exits are holding. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be the one that flips it or, or holds it necessarily, but you have to understand how those different exit strategies play into what you're doing because mm -hmm. holding an asset is much different than flipping an asset. And it's gonna change entirely how you look at putting that deal together yeah. if it's a flip or if it's a hold. And some deals can fit both buckets. Like it might make a good flip or it could also be a good hold. Um, but a lot of times it's pretty cut and clear, like, man, this is for sure an amazing flip, or this is for sure a great buy and hold. And, and so we want to make sure that we're clear on that. And I think also, hopefully we can talk a little bit about what might be the right strategy for you. I've got some very strong opinions around holding versus flipping. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not that one's better than the other, but it's more about timing. timing I think yeah. it's a lot about timing. Like, is it the right time to be holding versus mm. flipping? So we'll, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But, but Tony, why is it so important to be able to look at a deal, look at an opportunity and identify is the, is the best use of this deal to flip it so that I can take this to market if I'm wholesaling to a flipper or is the best opportunity here to hold it and rent it for cash flow, right. which one makes the most sense and, and why do I need to understand the differences between those? Yeah. And you know, before we get into that, I just want to say before I lose the thought is anybody can sit and read a script and get a deal, mm. right? Like you can put a really good script in front of somebody. They can read it verbatim <laughs> and get one out of 50 leads to convert or something like that, right? Yeah. It takes so many reps and so much learning and watching videos like this and going back and watching all your videos, which is something I did, you know, and I still do mm -hmm. um, to learn wholesaling to where now you're getting one out of 30 leads because you understand the exit, you understand properties, mm -hmm. you understand real estate, you understand seller situations. So, yeah. Motivations and situations and the way the market is right now. So we see it all the time in our office where a newbie comes in and they read verbatim a script and they get a contract. But our best closers, they have the script and they keep the structure, but they understand the exit. Our best closers are constantly coming over to Dispo, constantly talking about Burr methods and 1% rules and flips and creative and, and, creative and, and they're pitching <laughs> sub two and PITI, you know, they're <laughs> talking PITIs. Those are the guys and gals that get the one out of 25, one out of 30, you know, that, that are cold call leads. They're locking up one out of eight, you know, and, paid leads. And that's encouraging because what it means is it means you can come in right now. You could be watching this right now and never done a deal. And if you just show up, read the freaking script and show up, you'll get deals. You'll get deals. Now your close ratio will be really low, right? But you'll get, because what will happen is if you just show up in this business, the stars align. Like you'll just read the script and someone on the other line will be in the right place at the right time. They'll say yes and you'll get a deal together and you have no idea what you're doing, yeah. but you showed up and you did your thousand hours or you did a you know, hundred offers or whatever and got a deal. Yeah, And that's so amazing because it means newbies can just show up and actually make money in this business. It's a great industry where a newbie can come in. I mean, the first deal, the first phone call I ever made in wholesaling, I closed the deal. The very first Best call- story ever. And made, I think it was eight or 9,000 on that deal. The first deal I ever dispoed, I made $45,000 on that deal. And I didn't know anything about 
wholesaling or real estate or anything really. You were in the right place at the right time. I was time. in the right place at the right time, <laughs> found the right motivation for the seller to get that one under contract. It was in Memphis and I was telling him his property was in Jacksonville, Florida. Like I didn't yeah. even I didn't even have the right lead pulled up. It, yeah. it was a mess, but he was so motivated I got under contract. And same with the one I dispoed where it was a weird farmhouse outside of Cincinnati. And this one buyer just loved the land. It was an 1890s house that wasn't worth anything, but one guy was just like, this is a beautiful piece of land. I'll pay top dollar for it. You know, and that was my one buyer for it. Yeah. That made 45 grand. I didn't know what I was doing yet. So as newbies are in this business, if you just stick to a process, you can get <laughs> deals, you can exit deals. Um, but the importance of Knowing the exit strategy, like you said, if we're if it's a buy and hold deal or a fix and flip deal, whether you're wholesaling it or you're doing it yourself, you're taking it down yourself. One thing that I wrote on a piece of paper and put in every single cubicle of every single dispo uh, rep or dispo agent in my office uh, desk is your comps or your buyers, right? And what is the market telling you? It's all boils down to data. Really, mm -hmm. wholesaling is, I mean, real estate, it's all data, you know, it's black and white. It's the like- The market doesn't lie, the it, comps don't lie. It doesn't lie. So are your comps in your area, are they showing that there's 20 properties for sale and 10 of them are flips and 10 of them are pending on the MLS that are flips? It's like, all right, this is probably a flip area, right? People, mm -hmm. Investors are flipping in this area, that's the best strategy is are your comps showing that, man, there's just a lot of stuff that's clean, but not necessarily flipped. How do I come up with an ARV if there's nothing truly flipped in this area? Start looking at your rentals, look at your rental comps and see, all right, are, you know, are there you know, uh, 12 rentals in this neighborhood and they're all just kind of clean and the rents are going for 1900 and you're seeing that these buyers are buying them for, you know, 160 grand. And then it's like, all right, do the numbers make sense? It must be a big landlord area. Mm -hmm. And is it a mom and pop landlord? Is it institutional? All that stuff comes into play too, but it's really your comps that, sh that show you. And that matters so much in your numbers of what you can buy at. Like for example, if let's say that you're looking at that area and most of the stuff that's selling is in like rent ready, mm -hmm. we call it rent ready, move in ready, right. livable condition, but it's dated. So whether it's hammered or it's dated, if you're flipping it, you're gutting it and replacing it, right? So like that kitchen that's totally functional, a flipper's gonna pull it out and put a new kitchen in. Yeah. Whether the kitchen's missing or it's there, a flipper's gonna spend the money to renovate and bring it all new. Yeah. But what's the difference is now is if you miss this and you run the numbers for a flipper and you have a 50K rehab budget, then you got to buy it way down here. But if you're, if the market says that thing's rent ready, we're not going to do anything, maybe, maybe pain or, you know, like, but we're not going to do anything and we're just going to rent it. Now all of a sudden you can pay a whole lot more because you don't have a 50 K budget to rehab it. Like you guys grasping this, knowing how to look at a deal and know whether it's a great hold because a buy and old person's not going to put a brand new kitchen in no. it's a rental. They're not putting granite countertops in. It's a rental. Right. They're going to they're gonna do the bare minimum to make it rent ready and that's it. Right. So they're a, a landlord, a buy and hold is going to look at that deal much differently than a flipper is. Yes. And it could be in the same market and your numbers are going to drastically change as to what you're going to buy it for, what you're going to exit it for. Yeah. And we'll break all that down in a, in, in one of the videos in this series with the, the numbers and the formula, but not only are we going to do like flipping, but we're going to have a slew of different flipping Yes, and holding different holding. Cause there's multiple ways yeah. to look at holding and multiple ways to look at flipping with the same deal. Even like we can see a deal where, just like you said, and I think a lot of wholesalers screw this up too, where if they're running comps on, ARV and, and a flip, right? And this is where we, we run into this, which our property is in rent ready shape, right? And they're looking at comps that are completely rehabbed. But as you're on the phone, you're not seeing pictures of the, the house, right? You're talking to the seller yeah. over the phone. They're telling you, oh, the kitchen's super clean. It's good, yeah. it's whatever. You're not putting that into consideration on your rehab cost of the flip. Like yeah. you need to have that flip 
pulled up and you need to in detail ask your seller, all right, I know it's clean. I know it's, you have a yeah. tenant in there. It's, it's nice, but does it have, you know, the gray granite countertops? Right. Does it, what kind of backsplash does it have? Yeah. Does it have a deep farm kitchen or a sink in it? Like whatever yeah. the new stuff is, does it have recess lighting? Yeah, the furnace might be working fine, but if it's 15 years old, a flipper is gonna replace it. Yeah, in yeah. that flip, the one that you're using for ARV, does it have a new HVAC system? Does it have a brand new roof? roof. Did they take a wall down to open up the kitchen? Mm -hmm. Like you need to ask these detailed questions because if you're just saying, hey man, this property's in really good shape. I think it's only gonna take, you know, 20, 30 grand to get it to this ARV. Not when they need to put a new roof on, not when they need to put new windows in, HVAC, you know, take a wall down. All that comes into play and your numbers can get really screwed up. Now, having said that, if you are locking up deals properly on a fix and flip formula, that's the lowest you're going to get that deal. And you can exit this however you want and make your biggest spread. Our fix and flip spreads, I mean, we've done probably seven or eight six figure deals in the last mm -hmm. couple of years that were all flips, you yeah. know? And that's going to be your biggest spread is the fix and flip formula. Your deepest buy. Your deepest buy. But if you can't agree on that super discounted number with your seller, you need to look at rent ready properties in the area. What are they renting for? What are they selling for? Does it make sense for an investor to buy this and use it as a rental, which is all in the data. It's all in your cash comps. It's all in your rental comps, mm -hmm. all that. And you can see now like on um, any platform you use for running comps, you can see how many buyers are in this area that are buying cash in the last couple of years? We go back three years in that area and then filter it to, you know, do they own three, four or five properties mm -hmm. or more? Those are going to be your landlords plus all your rental comps. You, you know, you, if it's mom and pop, usually their numbers right there on Zillow mm -hmm. or there's property management companies you can call and see if you can mm -hmm. give them an opportunity. So, um, you know, you're going to, you're going to miss out if you're fix and flip formula, and that super deep discounted offer you give to your seller doesn't work because nine times out of 10, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But can you come up 20 grand? Can you come up 30, 40 grand on the same property and still exit it and make a $20,000 spread? And in certain markets, absolutely. Yeah. And then when you get into maybe offering creative, you might even be able to pay full market value if the, if the terms are right. I mean, it's just crazy how when you understand those different exits, what that does but the two primary thoughts you have to think about are, are we going to exit this deal? Are we, are we going to exit as a flip? Meaning the end game is to sell this at some point to retail. Are we going to get this property to the retail market? And that could be adding value, which would be a fix and flip, or it could be as is, which would be like a takedown or a wholesale. Or are we going to like just MLS it through mm -hmm. an assignment or innovation? Right. Right. But are we, is the goal here to flip this or are we looking for a hold to keep this for long term cash flow? And then there's all the different ways that you can hold too, because you could create a hold, you could, you could cash and then do a, a refinance burr method. Like there's, the, there's 1% rules and there's things that people are going to look at now to make that determination. Is this something that should be held for cash flow or flipped for profit? Mm -hmm. Right. So being able to identify that and understand how you evaluate, how you underwrite, how you run numbers, how a buyer is going to look at that deal and determine if it's a good deal. That's where this exit strategy, these philosophies we're talking about come into play and are just absolutely critical. So that was kind of the point of this video, really focus on the difference between buying and holding and flipping. Um, and being able to distinguish those. And one maybe general rule of thumb that we see often is typically the lower in price point in the market, like the, the median sale price in that market, the lower that is, the more you have buy and hold. Mm -hmm. Of course. Right. Because those are high rental, low income, high rental areas. So like if I'm wholesaling in a market that's, you know, under a hundred thousand or, or even under 200,000, 75% are probably buy and hold. Right. Yeah. Right. There's still flippers there, but the majority of them are going to be looking at those properties to hold for rental yeah. because it's a low income, which means low income means you're going to have more renters than owners. Yes. 
they cash flow on paper, at least on paper, they cash flow higher. Mm -hmm. So you just have a lot of investors in those lower income markets that want for cash flow. Yeah, and we need to look at deals like that too and how we pull data for, you know, acquisitions and all that because, you know, our, especially with, and that's why it's so important to know the Burr method and, and refinancing properties for buy and hold rentals. And another thing is asking your buyers the percentages they buy at or buy yeah. and hold at. Like everybody asks me that. It's like, how do I know my market? How do I know what investors want a percent of ARV they want to buy it on a flip? How do I know mm -hmm. the percent they want to buy on a on a buy and hold? It's like, well, you're talking to cash buyers all day, all long. day long. I would just ask the question <laughs> if I was you. Um, and you can start getting that that feedback. And like we said in the previous video, it's like that feedback is so important in everything that buyer tells you about the market, about this particular property, needs to be put in the notes, in their profile, so you know, okay, here's the pattern. Every buyer I'm talking to in this area, in this market, they're saying they're going off a 1% rule or 1.5% rule, or they're buying at 75% or 70% ARV yep. as a flip. So now you know on acquisition side, here's the formula we need to use on these deals to lock them up properly. Right. You know? we I have one market in uh, Florida, in the panhandle and we learned some things really quickly when we opened that market. First thing we learned was that uh, there's a lot more short-term rental than long-term rental because it's kind of beach town, right? So yeah. we completely focus on that typically, like m the majority. And, um, and even on our long terms, the 1% rule, which is we'll get to, it's a, it's a rule with uh, buy and hold, there it's 2%. Mm -hmm. So it's just, that's the market. And we've learned yeah. that through talking and learning our market, investing in, understanding our buyers, what they're looking for, how they evaluate deals. So we have these general rules, like the general rule, and I teach this all the time on, on my YouTube channel here is, uh, you know, for flippers, it's 70% of ARV, less repairs, less your wholesale fee equals your buy price. And that's a great like ballpark standard number. But if you take that as gospel and that's all you're using, you're going to miss out on a lot of deals because- yeah. Every market's a little different. Maybe buyers are paying 75%. We saw people going all the way up to 80, 85, 90 during the boom. And so yeah. we adjusted, right? Wholesaling is basically what will the market pay less my fee? Yes. And it's your job to figure out what will the market pay? Yeah. And, and we, we saw, sorry. And we saw institutional buyers buying at 97%, <laughs> yeah. you know, during a the $1. ten. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's still certain markets. I mean, I, you know, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. For some reason, it's a booming market. I don't know why, but it is. A lot of people move in there. And there's still buyers buying at 80%, you know, because, but you got to look at like the median house price too. And it's like, are, is this deal, the flippers look at this, like, because the interest rates are so high, and this is going to help acquisitions and dispo and everybody, thinking about the market, you got to know your market so well. And if the median home price is 250000 and now we know, um, like in a, in a certain market, say, now we know interest rates are, you know, 7.5% or whatever they are on a 30-year fixed. If they're trying to fix and flip a $400,000 house, your buyer pool shrinks way down on the exit, right? Mm -hmm. If you're flipping or holding or whatever, a property that's $230,000, your payments are not that far off from what they were a couple years ago when interest rates were 3%. Mm -hmm. As compared to a property that's $400,000, now your payments every month on a 30-year mortgage are $1,200 more a month, which is make it or break it for a lot of people. Yeah, but, if it, but if it's a $200,000 house, Okay, maybe they come up a few hundred dollars, but you guys can, but that buyer can live with that and they're still buying those properties. Like properties are still getting sold. It's just, there's kind of this, there's this weird sweet spot in, in the market right now that I see. I don't know if you agree with this. This is a good question for you. But like under median home prices in a market, mm -hmm. those are still moving, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like high end stuff is still moving. It's kind of that in between that half million dollar range that we see, like it's kind of in limbo. I would totally agree with that. And I think that's also, you know, if you look at the direction of just wealth in America, the middle class is shrinking. And so, you know, you have, you have people that are really struggling to, to even buy a home mm -hmm. and they can't afford a lot of markets like out West. I mean, 
you cannot afford in Phoenix, in Washington, in Montana, in Utah, like a, a, a starter home is $500,000 now yeah. in some of these markets. Yeah. And so you, you've made that, that part of the market is shrinking. Yeah. And it's on a, a five hundred thousand market, like I don't know what a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage is. We could probably do the math in our heads a little bit, but it's probably you know high thirty eight hundred or something you, a month. You got to be making a hundred grand a year, pretty much, and you're still kind of house poor, right? You know, a, half your income after taxes is going towards your house, and yeah. you're only left with a few thousand dollars for everything else. So, you know, it, the market is is dictating a lot, obviously. Um, and you're absolutely right with the middle class, you know, kind of going away in this country, it's the high end stuff and the low end stuff that that's selling. And you need to understand all of that. You can't go through life and whole, think you're going to be successful in real estate or even if you're just wholesaling, whatever it is, you, you got to be educated on what the, the climate of the market, the climate of everything. It's an election year this year. You don't think that's Playing a role in playing a role in, in real estate, <laughs> you know, people don't realize that real estate in America is unlike any other country, really. Like that controls our economy, and it's not like that everywhere. People yeah. don't realize that. Like yeah. real estate doesn't control the economy in Mexico, right? <laughs> right? It does in America, yeah. and we're a rare country that allows foreign investors too. Yeah. There's all these things going on um, with real estate investing and you need to be educated on it so you can get ahead of the curves that are coming and be prepared for them. Whether it's regulations, the way the market's changing, the way your buyers are changing, interest rates, the way MLS is changing and the way we can market on the MLS and the way you realtors are getting sued for, you know, uh, inflating mm -hmm. commissions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. It's, it, it's kind of shaky, but these are the times the good educated people take advantage of it and make a ton of wealth. Like we want this instability. If everything was hunky dory, there wouldn't be distressed homeowners that needed cash for their house, right? Yeah. There wouldn't be this influx of cash to the wealthy where they're now buying and holding and flipping properties. So, you know, we control that with off market real estate, direct to seller and direct to buyer. And we need to, we need to take advantage of that by being educated. Yeah, totally. So guys, we're going to be breaking down as we get into these different exit strategies. So when we start talking about flipping strategies, remember the intent there is to get out of the deal and make a profit. So it's about the cash, the lump sum cash in a deal. And that's, that's the entire focus of flipping is one way or another, how do we get a, a lump sum of cash? Whereas the hold strategies are primarily more focused on cash flow. How do I make now a monthly, pay, a monthly cash flow, net income on cash flow, and stay in the asset for a determined amount of time, right? And those are two completely different trains of thought. And you gotta be able to wear each of those hats and understand how does a buy and hold investor going to look at this deal? What are they primarily concerned about? And there's multiple things there. It's not always just cash flow. It could be tax advantages mm -hmm. and, and they might be thinking, you know, long-term appreciation and all these different things, but a, a whole, a looking at a deal to hold versus looking at a deal to flip are two completely different mindsets that you have to understand. Yes. I mean, there's going to be three buyers for your deal, right? It's going to be a flipper, a buy and hold guy, or an end buyer that's going to live in a retail a property. Yep. So out of, if we know those are our three buyers, how do we best present this deal to them? What makes sense? And then knowing that will determine your conversation with the seller exactly. and your numbers with the seller. Yep. If you know this will work no matter what on an exit on a fix and flip formula, and you know you can come up 20, 30 grand on an offer because of a buy and hold formula or an ovations or an MLS or an end buyer or a takedown method, then keep that your little secret in your back pocket. <laughs> Try and get these as low as you can. Yeah. If you can't, at least you know the market so well, you know your buyers so well, you know real estate so well, where you can keep that negotiation going up. The seller wins, they feel like they win, you win and, and the buyer wins. I'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this video today, right here where I'm recording at the Looking Glass Hotel and Event Center. Located in the heart of San Juan, Puerto Rico, just 10 minutes from the airport and walking distance to the best restaurants, shopping, and beaches, this newly renovated hotel is the perfect spot for meetups, 
events, retreats, and podcasting. So if you want to create an unforgettable experience, come to the Looking Glass Hotel and Event Center. Click the link below this video in the description for more details. Yeah, our, our strategy is uh, we anchor at the very low. So that's where we, we come out of the gate at the very low. Uh, and then based on the seller's situation, motivation usually, and the prop opportunity with the property, we then can adjust into these yes. all these different exits to find the right one. Yeah, and I, I do it personally too with the anchor. It works. Yeah. I just bought a house that was listed at 1.1 mm -hmm. million. And I'm like, I'm a wholesaler. I ain't paying retail yeah. for any house, right? Anchored it's in them your blood at, now to get a deal. Yeah, <laughs> I will not buy <laughs> retail. And I anchored the seller. He was uh, the broker in charge and the realtor as well. So it was kind of nice. I could just have a conversation. I didn't have a realtor, obviously. I anchored him at 965. And he thought I was crazy. Why would I offend him this way? Blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. He comes back at 995. We <laughs> settled at 975. Yeah. And you could do that. I mean, that's just the tactic you use in any negotiation, right? Offend them on the first mm -hmm. offer and eke your way up and, yeah. and meet somewhere in the middle. They, they come down exponentially. You come up incrementally. Yes. You know what I mean? Like that's just good real estate yeah. strategy. Absolutely. So that's what we're going to be doing throughout the series, guys. And if, if you're new to the series, if you don't know Tony, you really want to get into his world. I'm going to put some links in the description for his socials. And also he's doing some really phenomenal things on the education side. He's got a phenomenal course that teaches all about how to do dispo at a high level. Uh, also has a community where he does calls with them and, and live training. So I'll put that information below and you guys can check that out as well so that you can keep progressing, keep learning, take this as a really good starting point and, and springboard into you know blowing up your business. There's no one watching this right now that can't build a million dollar plus a year business doing this. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and all the education is out there. You it's can't go here. to college and learn this. You can learn it from Jerry and Tony. And everybody right. on here can do the exact same thing. When you started in real estate, I mean, did you have any idea what you were doing? It was 20 years ago and none of this was available. None of it was available. You had to learn yeah. the hard way. Yeah. And I kind of feel the same way in dispositions too. I started, thank God I had your videos on YouTube at the time where I could, you know, all that, you know, legacy information on YouTube. I could, I could, every time I would YouTube uh, search, how do I find cash buyers? Jerry Norton, Jerry Norton, Jerry Norton. So I'm like, thank God I had that that base yeah. on how to come up with a, a true process because there was not disposition processes out mm -hmm. there. I'd go to all these events. We would, you know, pay. I've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. in mentorships and and coaches in the industry, and I'm always hyper focused on dispo because that's what I do. And I'm like, what is your true dispo? What are the KPIs? What are yeah. the scripts? And they're like. Yeah, we don't really have KPIs or yeah. scripts or processes. Just throw it on uh, Facebook Marketplace. You'll be good. And it's yeah. like, that's not a process. Um, so, yeah, same here. It's like, you know, we all started probably a, 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 at the same spot a lot, a lot of people watch and started. And there's nothing special about us, right? We just put in the work. We learned as much as humanly possible. We implemented it. We ride the waves of mm -hmm. ups and downs. We don't give up. And here we are. Yeah, and we're going to be laying that all out. Like we're going to be putting it all out there for you guys. It's going to be a, a phenomenal series that we're putting together here. Don't miss any of it. Be sure to uh, to subscribe. Be sure to watch the playlist. We'll put a playlist link in the description where we're going to put all these videos. And we're just super excited, guys, to bring all of this value to you. Leave a comment and say, Tony, you're a flipping genius. Because he flew <laughs> all the way here to sit down and share this with you guys. I hope you appreciate that. That's not his time is valuable. So please. Show him some love and tell him that, and we'll see you guys on the next video.